Uh, well, let me just introduce our speaker who is uh, well known to our members, to the people who come to um, the Institute. Uh, his name is Lazana Hotep, and I've known him for, boy, probably 15 years at least, maybe even more now as I think about it, because um, I met him at uh, Arizona State University where he was doing graduate work, and he had an organization that brought uh, various uh, speakers, outstanding speakers, and that he included me in that once or twice to come to Arizona uh, State and, and speak for the graduate students. And so he, he, he moved away from that, graduated um, to the level of being a dean uh, at um, uh, Skyline uh, College and a group of colleges in, uh, near Oakland, California, where he was in charge of equity. And he was also founder of the Equity Institute. Uh, he did such a thorough job at that uh, uh, place and in that work that the uh, University of California, Berkeley, simply sort of picked him uh, off and said, look, come over and direct our equity uh, and diversity and inclusion work. And, and I just should tell people, just for transparency's sake, that uh, when I have um, uh, when I have some issue uh, about diversity or equity, some issues like that that I need to get advice from, there are two people that I call. And uh, one of them is Valerie Harrison and the other one is Lazana Hotel. And I, I must tell publicly, because some people sometimes say, Dr. Sanjay, you got some good ideas. Well, a lot of my ideas come from Lazana Hotel and Valerie Harrison and, and other people for other things. I mean, there, there are certainly other scholars that I get uh, information from. But uh, Lazana is um, now at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a friend to the Maleficati Asante Institute. In fact, um, uh, sometimes if you ever in the building, you will see a uh, a, uh, a television monitor and everything. He was the first one to make a, a personal contribution to the Institute to give us uh, the facility to be able to project and also to show uh, videos. So we're really delighted that uh, he's uh, speaking for us today. Uh, Lazada Hotel, you're on. Thank you, Baba Malefe. Um, it's really, uh humbling to uh, hear you chronicle our, our connection and our bond and uh, the immense respect that I have for you and your contribution and uh, the contributions of so many who have joined us uh, this afternoon. I'm honored and humbled to always be invited uh, back into the fold to be a fellow of the MKA Institute uh, for Afrocentric Study. Um, and this time you asked me to speak about uh, a particular topic Right, so you asked me to speak about cultural diversity in the United States, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, being a, a protege of yours, uh, I, I'm speaking about it from an African-centered perspective, which I don't know how many people actually talk about diversity in America uh, from an African-centered perspective. And so, I have a lot to say in a little time, so I'm going to jump right into it. But thank you very much, Baba, for the invitation, and and welcome to all who are in attendance. I'm going to start off with a story. Uh, this college institution uh, that allows uh, students to do presentations at the end of the year and they get to dress up uh, as characters from plays and from television shows and from movies. So they may say, hey, we want to do our final project and we want to dress up like the cast of The Wizard of Oz. Or we want to do our final project and we want to dress up like the Avengers. Well, there's one particular group in the class decided that they want to dress up like the cast from a television show on Netflix called Orange is the New Black. And Orange is the New Black is a television show that's centered around women in prison. And it's women from multiple backgrounds. And so it was the day of the presentation and one of the students wanted to play the African-American character, but she wasn't black. So she began to put dark makeup on her face. And she put dark makeup on her face. Another one of the students said, um, I don't think that's a good idea. 
I think you should talk to the professor. And so the professor, the student goes to the professor, the professor says, is it part of your costume? The student said, yes. She said, well, go ahead and have fun with it. And so the student proceeded to put dark makeup all over her face and present it. Half of the class was appalled and shocked. The other half of the class was holding their stomach, bent over, laughing. The student who had uh, recommended that uh, the student talk to the professor just took it as a bad class day, didn't say anything about it. But the next time the class met, the teacher had taken pictures of the presentations and made a PowerPoint slide and put up a PowerPoint slide of the student with the dark makeup on her face. Half the class was appalled and shocked. The other half held their stomachs holding, uh, uh, folded in laughter. And so at that point, the student who reported, uh, who, who, who recommended that the, uh, the student talk to the teacher, she reported it to the dean and the dean reported it to the president. Now, in this real life scenario that I had to address uh, within an institution, these are the cast of characters. The student who was putting the dark makeup on her face was an international student from Korea. The professor who said it's okay to put the dark makeup on your face and perform is Chinese American. <laughs> her husband is African American and they have children that are Chinese and African American. The student who reported all of this was a white student. The dean she reported to was Latinx and the president of the college was African-American. Now, the reason why I show this is not to just show how Californian this is as far as the diversity in makeup or how cosmopolitan it could be, but just to show that we would think that certain people will be exempt, right, from having to have a conversation about cultural identity, about cultural insensitivity, and about dehumanization, especially someone who, is, who has African-American people in their household. But as you can see, that none of us are exempt from these realities, and we have to have a particular type of orientation and understanding of the role that cultural identity truly plays in the United States of America. But unfortunately, we mostly focus our talks about diversity and our cultural identity around what we call the three Fs, food, festival, and fun. And so when we talk about identity, we talk about, well, let's have some kind of event where we all bring a different dish, or let's all listen to different types of music, or let's all have some type of cultural celebration. Let's celebrate the diversity. But this particular approach has not been an approach that's been able to really get to the crux of some of the challenges of why we're having a difficult time having a true pluralistic and multiracial society. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, to the family that's assembled this afternoon. And as we have this conversation, we're having it on Zoom, as Baba Malefe pointed out, because we're in this pandemic, and some people call it a, a twin pandemic or a double pandemic, the pandemic of this public health crisis of the novel coronavirus, as well as this pandemic of race and racism. And as you can see, as Baba alluded to, it is having its impact on families and communities along cultural lines and along racial lines for a variety of reasons, whether we're from communities that are frontline workers or we're from communities that have uh, not had access to healthcare and health disparities. And then you see people from all different backgrounds taking to the streets and people are seeing this as a sign of a collective uh, coming together that is unprecedented. In some ways, right, it may be unprecedented, but we're going to talk about in some ways how it may not be as unprecedented as we uh, uh, think we like to think. And, and many of us are saying this is precipitated by the murder of one uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, in March of this year. And as you can see in this uh, portrait painted by Kadir Nelson, you know, George Floyd's body is filled with a legacy of people of African ancestry. In his case, is just one representative of this torturous, terroristic experience that many of us had. And as you can see at the top of his body, you can see the Freddie Grays and the Breonna Taylors and the mm -hmm. Sons of Lands, right? And so many others, the Tamir Rices, right? Who have also been victims of either extrajudicial killings by police or by vigilantes. And so when we have this conversation about multiculturalism or diversity in America. It takes me back to my early days as an organizer, as a college student, when we brought Kwame Touré to the university. 
And Kwame Ture told us that our responsibility is to create harmonious human relationships. But in order to create harmonious human relationships, we have to know what are actually the barriers to us having these harmonious human relationships. What are the factors that are keeping humans from being able to work together collectively for the common good? And so in my work, I start here. When I work with various institutions, I work with them on this approach, that before we can get into all of these different strategies and questions on why we can and why we can't, we have to do this. We have to challenge our assumptions, not just our assumptions about particular cultural groups, but our assumptions about the understandings we have about what we're actually trying to do. And then we have to interrogate narratives. Right? We have to interrogate the narratives that we've been given, and, and I'll explain to you why uh, shortly. Then we have to reconcile the history with the narrative. We have to line up the historical record with the narratives we've been given. Then we have to adopt frameworks that will allow us to move beyond where we are, and then we, of course, have to engage in the practice. Because if not, if we just want the equity, diversity, inclusion person to just show up and just give us equity, this is how our institutions will look, this is how our work will look, and this is how our relationship will look. It would look like this horrible paint job that wouldn't pass the snuff on any HGTV show. I don't care who the host is, right? Because they didn't take time to deal with what was underneath. They just tried to paint over it. And a lot of the work around race, a lot of the work around culture, and a lot of the work around identity that's being done today, people are just trying to paint over all of the socialization that they've had up until this point and think that they're gonna get a different result. And they really aren't, right? And so three of the popular terms that I challenge people on in this work are the terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You're hearing them all over the place and they're ubiquitous. So the first thing I'm gonna do is challenge our assumptions about what our understanding of these three terms are and then we'll move on, right? So to talk about diversity, we'll start with this. If we were able to go to London, England, and we can't because we, uh, many of us on this call have American passports and we're not allowed into London, England. Let's say we were. <laughs> we were to walk out of Heathrow Airport and we walked out of Heathrow, one of us might say, you know what, they drive on the other side of the street out here. Another one might say, they drive on a different side of the street out here. But most people in the United States of America would say they drive on the what? The wrong side. The wrong side. <laughs> they drive on the wrong side of the street because in the United States of America, difference just isn't different. Different has to be seen through a prism of hierarchy, through a prism of right and wrong, through a prism of good and bad. And my good friend and colleague Jeff Chang talks about it like this in his book, Who We Be. He says, difference is human and noticing difference is human. For whites, historically, skin tone and physiognomy signal not only difference, not notions of superiority and inferiority, but notions of inferiority and superiority. This was the way racial power worked. It went further than merely perceiving difference. It sorted difference into vast systems of freedom and slavery, commitment and neglect, investment in, uh, in abandonment, mobility, and containment. I apologize for my mispronunciations. I have high energy and anxiety because I'm so excited about this conversation. And so in America, we have a legacy that things weren't just different, that you had to deal with these kinds of realities. And so when people talk about diversity in America, but want to not understand that being different in America was not just a matter of not being the same, but it was not being the same and now there's some type of value added to it. That becomes problematic in a conversation about diversity. We have to interrogate what do we mean by diversity and why do we have these assumptions? And so when we talk about diversity, we have to define it as this. Diversity is the recognition of difference without what? Bias and judgment, without bias in judgment. It's not just difference, but a lot of people just say that. Diversity is everything. We all have different races. We all have different ethnicity. We all have different genders. We all have different sexual orientations. And that's how they start diversity work. But our diversity work has to be the recognition of difference and then interrogating 
why we have assigned judgment. Now, this other word that's becoming pretty ubiquitous is equity. And equity is used as a synonym for everything. It's being used as a synonym for people of color. It's being used as a synonym for diversity. It's being used as a synonym everywhere, right? And primarily a lot of the work that I've done over the years at various institutions, whether I've worked at those institutions or whether uh, I've consulted those institutions, everyone wants to talk about equity this and equity that. But we have a misunderstanding of what equity is. Normally when you start talking about equity and people do these kinds of workshops, somebody shows the picture of the people uh, standing at the baseball game behind the fence and they got little boxes and big boxes and all that kind of stuff, right? And it's interesting when I see that because depending on how woke, the woke amateur of the people who are in the thing, that people be like, why is there a fence? And then other people, you know, some, one time I was in a session, somebody said, why ain't they in the game? Because they're not baseball players. That's why they're not in the game. So I don't use that analogy for a variety of reasons. So to get a, people an understanding of what we really mean by equity, I use this, right? And so what you see here is what you commonly see in a lot of public spaces where you have a public space and they have public restrooms and you go look at the restrooms and the one labeled for men or guys has virtually no line and in this particular picture not only does it have a line the guy's just sauntering out on his way back to the beach but the one labeled <laughs> women or ladies has a long long line what you're looking at here family is equality one for this group one for that group but as we can clearly see in this image that equality can pr have disproportionate impact you can have disparate impact even though everybody has the same thing, right? Because it's not about just giving everybody the same thing. It's about taking consideration what are the needs. Now, we can clearly see that the problem is structural, that there's either not enough restrooms for women or there's not enough stalls in the restroom label for women. But the way in which we deal with race and identity and equity, we don't do that. We say, what is wrong with that group that's being disproportionately impacted because we made everything equal? Why is it that it takes women so long to use the restroom? What's wrong with them? Maybe we need somebody to write a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation. Maybe we need to have conferences about why women take so long to use the restroom. Then we need to find those women that despite this, any, you know, this disparate impact who can use the restroom really fast and we put them on panels and take them to conferences and they shame all the other women who can't use the restroom as fast. That's what we do racially. We find those people who made it in spite of racism, in spite of sexism, in spite of the dehumanization and say, see, they made it, what's wrong with you, right? Without acknowledging the structural impact. And so what we have to understand is the main difference between equality and equity is this. This is equality using what I call the potty parity scenario. Equity might look something like this or it might look something like this, right? But this is where the, the rub is. And this is where it's very difficult for organizations to have equity. It's because we will say, hey, we need to pitch a scenario like this that deals with the disproportionate impact. But the group that's not disproportionately impacted in this particular scenario, men will say, that's not fair. If you give them one, you gotta give us one. <laughs> even if they don't what? They don't even need one. <laughs> And so now we start to get into this conversation about what's fair and what's not fair, which takes the conversation from about equity and how equal is not producing equitable opportunities nor equitable outcomes. And therefore, groups that are disproportionately impacted rarely get rarely gets, uh, their issues addressed. And so when we're talking about equity, we talk about the practice of developing structures within organizations that take into consideration the unique challenges and barriers faced by disproportionately impacted groups. And they're not facing these challenges because there's something quote unquote wrong with them or something within the culture of the group. They're facing the challenges because of the structure, the design of the institution itself, right? And so when we talk about that, we can take this conversation about equity to an actual fiscal equity sense, right? We're always talking about the wealth gap. You know, some people talk about the income gap, we talk about the wealth gap. And what people don't understand about these gaps is these gaps are based on structural institutional decisions that have been made at the federal government level carried out by private institutions. So to get an understanding on why we have disparity in terms of wealth 
in terms of people of color, and especially people of African ancestry in the United States of America, compared to our white brothers and sisters, we're going to watch this video that kind of gives us some perspective. We came to Levittown and we found the model house. Oh. We walked in and we looked around. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in the eyes of a a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto, so to speak. Okay. It was an interesting experience, interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences. Okay. Very fascinating. All right. Eugene Burnett came okay. home with almost a million other black GIs. Okay. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. It was as though it wasn't real. You can't imagine. But for someone to come out and actually tell you that they can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on an up, oh, man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. Race had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk so that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanize in America, and it suburbanized it racially. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood, uh, unstable socially, but therefore also unstable economically. When the white residents of Eight Mile Road in Detroit were told they were too close to a black neighborhood to qualify for a positive FHA rating, they built this six-foot wall between themselves and their black neighbors. Once the wall went up, mortgages on the white properties were approved. Between 1934 and 1962, the federal government underwrote $120 billion in new housing. Less than 2% went to non-whites. I can understand an individual, depending on his environment or his family or whatever, uh, being racist, but for your country to um, sanction it, give him tools to do that. There's something deadly wrong there. So when there are certain communities given a $120 billion financial advantage supported by the federal government and other communities to be left out of that, that can contribute to some of the challenges that we see around a truly pluralistic 
in a truly multiracial society. Um, but if we don't deal with this, and we think this is about a kumbaya moment, we forget that the disparities that we see are the tr true challenges to having true cultural diversity. And so the next term that you always see is, like I said, inclusion. And inclusion is normally just about, well, let's just have more diversity. That's normally how people approach it, as you can see through this comic. And so it goes from having everybody at the table looking like this, to you'll see companies or you'll see institutions, uh, educational institutions using images like this when they're talking about inclusion. Um, or you'll see uh, uh, them uh, uh, just you know, bringing people to the table. But inclusion is going beyond this, which is, which, we're, which is tokenism. Normally what people are calling inclusion is tokenism. It's trying to get someone who's different than who's already been at the table there, right? Just to uh, give the appearance of, right? It's about dressing. But inclusion is truly about power, right? Inclusion is that not only do you have people at the table who are traditionally not being at the table, but they are part of the decision-making process, right? And they have resources and they have agency. So people who are doing so-called DEI work, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, have to really understand what they're dealing with. Now, a lot of the work that I do is across a variety of different uh, areas and take a lot of different factors into consideration. But one thing that I'm very uh, adamant about is this, is that when we're talking about diversity and we're talking about a variety of other different uh, uh, ways in which we express ourselves, people bring up other circumstances. They say, what, what about class? What about social economic status? What about ability and disability? What about gender? What about our queer LBGTQ brothers and sisters? What about intersectionality? And I tell everyone that I am an advocate for intersection, intersectional analysis. I'm an advocate for looking at these various other factors. But what has happened is that these other factors have been included in the racial analysis, not because people sincerely, right, uh, want to talk about intersectionality is a way to weaponize those particular identities so that we don't have to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Because they bring them up, not in a sincere way to say, well, let's talk about these intersecting identities. They bring it up as a way to say, let's get race off the table. And so what I try to get people to understand is this, it's okay to specifically talk about race. And then it's also okay to talk about intersections of time and place for everything. No one goes to the Susan uh, 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 G. Coleman breast cancer rally and say, what about heart disease? <laughs> no, we know that you, you can talk about breast cancer at one rally. You can talk about heart disease at another rally. You can talk about prostate cancer, right? It's, it's not, you, ha you see what I'm saying? But what happens when it comes to us talking about what's happening in our communities, people like to conflate things, right? And they like to uh, dilute things. And so we have to understand that when, when are we actually talking about intersectionality versus when are these other identities being weaponized to not talk about race and its impact on why we have disparities. And so when we're talking about race in contemporary sp spaces, one of the most popular things is to say, hey, it's not about race anymore. It's about these other things, right? And we call that uh, color blindness. You know, you hear the statement, I don't see color. I just see people. Or you hear another uh, uh, ancient American proverb, you know, I don't care if you're purple, you know, or yellow or green. I care if you're purple. If I see a purple person, I'm going to have to talk about it, right? But we have all these, these different platitudes that we have, have come to use, right? But Eduardo Bonilla Silver, who's at uh, Duke University, says, colorblind racism is the new racial music most people dance to. The new racism is subtle, institutionalized, and seemingly non-racial. Now, this comes from his book, Racism Without Racism. And I love the title of the book, right? Because it reminds me when I'm driving down the street and I see a McDonald's, and McDonald's has a, 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 a billboard that says, over 60 billion served. But when I talk to all my friends, nobody admits that they eat at McDonald's. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and that's the same way I feel about racism. I said, like, how all this racism exists, but ain't nobody racist. And that don't even match, right? But this is the kind of world we live in, okay? And so he says in the book, he says, most whites believe that if blacks and other groups would just stop thinking about the past, work hard, and complain less, particularly about racial discrimination, then Americans of all hues would, quote unquote, 
get along. And of course, this is how everything works. The only reason why you have poverty is because people keep talking about being poor. Right? The only reason why you have, you know, headaches is because people keep talking about having headaches. No, this is this is these these logics that are only given in a racialized uh, analysis. They don't work anywhere else. And so what happens is a lot of organizations, whether they're corporate organizations or nonprofits or educational institutions, their remedy is to give people a whole bunch of what they call implicit or unconscious bias workshops. And many of you all may be familiar with mm -hmm. that. And I do not knock the implicit or unconscious bias studies in the data. But what I'm saying is that the bias may not be as unconscious as we claim it to be. And we have Jane Elliott to thank for making that very crystal clear in a lot of different instances. I want every white person in this room who would be happy to be treated as this society in general treats our citizens, our black citizens. If you, as a white person, would be happy to receive the same treatment that our black citizens do in this society, please stand. You didn't understand the directions. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. So Dr. Benia Silver goes on in Racism Without Racism to say, whereas Jim Crow racism explained Black social standing as a result of their biological or moral inferiority, colorblind racism rationalizes people's contemporary status as a product of market dynamics, naturally occurring phenomena, and Blacks' imputed cultural limitations. And so they realized that it was out of vogue and politically incorrect, right, to, to attribute it to some type of pseudoscience, and that's why I have the eugenics journal there, or some type of biological science like phrenology, uh, especially after World War II and what happened to, uh, in, in Nazi Germany with the killing of uh, six million Jewish people, right? And so now they say, well, we have to have another rationale for why these people, right, are not fully a part of the body politic. Right? While they fully don't have economic equality. So we have to find blame within them. And so what happens is people begin to make this thing about morality and individual behavior instead of having a systemic analysis. And that's why James Baldwin is very instructive here because he's always been clear that it's not about individual feelings and individual interpersonal relationships. It's about being able to examine the institution collectively. I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, that the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That's what's a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me, that doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything We're against black right? people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. And so we have to interrogate this notion of the American narrative. When we talk about diversity, when we talk about inclusion, when we talk about equity, you know, we have to deal with this notion of interrogating the narrative. And the narrative of America, right, is typically expressed like this, as you see David Brooks put in New York Times. America has always been a divided, sprawling country, but most of its history is held together by a unifying national story. As I noted a couple of months ago, it was an exodus story. It was the story of leaving the oppressions of the old world, venturing into the wilderness and creating a new promised land. In this story, America was the fulfillment of human history, the last best hope of the earth. That story rested upon an amazing level of national confidence. It was an explicitly Judeo-Christian story built on certain views of God's providential plan. And so when you look at the timeline in which the way the American narrative is told, right, we are all given this overarching narrative that no matter what cultural group you're from, 
no matter what gender you're from, no matter what your sexual orientation, no matter what your true reality is, we're given this story. That's why we all can finish this rhyme. In 1492, Columbus what? Yeah, yeah, you know, because we're all given, right? And then you have the narrative that says, you know, Columbus came in 1492, and then a great republic was created in 1776. And then the republic wanted to deal with this quote unquote original sin. So in 1865, it fought the Civil War. And then out of the Civil War, we were able to realize our errors in gender, and we gave women the right to vote in 1919. And then we had the good old days in the 1950s. And this is the narrative of the United States of America, right? But is there anything missing from that narrative, right? There's a lot missing from that narrative, you know? And so what we have to understand is about this overarching narrative, right? Julian Hasford talks about the dominant cultural narratives defined as the overlearned stories communicated through mass media or other large social and cultural institutions and social networks are systems of representation that function as subtle mechanisms of oppression and social control that shape cultural norms and personal beliefs while concealing the processes that produce them. They operate as legitimizing myths that justify the maintenance of unequal intergroup relations. And so one of the things that we see that's missing from the narrative is the genocide of the indigenous folks. And the policy after they realized they couldn't wipe them out physically through their genocide attempts is to so-called civilize them. And this was their position of civilizing them, to put them in what they call Indian schools, kidnap them from their parents, put them in Indian schools. And the, the policy was called kill the Indian, save, save the, the man. man. This is reconciling the narrative versus the history. And they will publish these type of pictures. This is him as his native indigenous self. But as you can see over here in the before and after picture, we have civilized. He's able to be civilized. You know, when you see uh, our sister like Elizabeth Eckford going to school, struggling on the front lines for the freedom of her people to be able to move about, because one thing about freedom is not necessarily being around other groups, it's about to be moving without restriction, right? And you change the narrative of these women, these valiant women who have stood on the front lines uh, from time in memoriam in African history, from Queen Nzinga and Yaa Santiwa to Ida B. Wells and Harriet Tubman, to all of them, to changing the narrative of Black women to being this, to being welfare, welfare queens. See, we're going to shift the narrative, right? Even though we know historically that all social and public health, uh, uh, social and public uh, benefit go to the majority white people, right? But we have to create this narrative. Right? So when you start talking about Latinx communities, we don't talk about how they've been excluded. We talk about how they are, quote unquote, illegal and how they are discouraged and they're using uh, American resources. And we talk more about specifically the timeline. If you juxtapose the timeline of the American narrative to the timeline of Black Americans, right? Most people have a disjointed, misunderstood timeline of what Black Americans are, right? It goes something like this. We as an African doing God knows what, but God knows who. And then somehow we got into slavery, and then Harriet Tubman came. And then Harriet Tubman came, and after she came, about five, six minutes after that, Martin Luther King Jr. came. And then Martin Luther King Jr. did two things. He helped get Africans from enslavement, and he helped Barack Obama get elected president. <laughs> and they made the movie Black Panther. <laughs> this is the story. This is the timeline, right? I remember I was doing a talk, and this is hyperbole what I just told you, but this is not hyperbole. I did a similar timeline like this at a lecture, and I, and, I, and I said, hey, can anyone tell me what year Martin Luther King Jr. ended slavery? And this one guy in the front row said, ooh, I can tell you. I said, please, don't, don't raise your hand, young man. That was a joke, right? But the past is just all the past, right? right? Because people don't go by the historical record, they go by the narrative that they're given. So they literally think that Frederick Douglass was sitting at a table with Ida B. Wells, who also had Martin Luther King and also had, right? Soldier on the Truth, right? They all, this is all the past. It's all just fighting for freedom, right? When you really look at the timeline, when I mean reconciling the histories, in this case, I'm using our history in particular, 
right? It's a lot more involved. So when people say, well, what have black people contributed to the world? Well, we contribute human, right? Compute, contribute the first high culture. We contribute the West African civilizations. Yes, we went through a Ma'afa in a low point. Yes, we went through the Nadir, but we had enduring uh, uh, communities that kept persevering and we went through the civil rights movement. And then we have our hip hop, right? And then we have today, uh, and a lot of people symbolize it in the rise of Barack Obama, but there's a long protract, protracted multi-millennial experience that we have not reconciled because we're going off of these narratives. So how do we get to the next level? Sonia Douglas Horford argues that we need to become racially literate to really achieve a meaningful sense of diversity, to really be a pluralistic society. And she said that racial literacy means understanding what race is, how it works, and its relationship to inequality, and in our case, inequity. And this is what people really do not understand. They don't want to, people will say now, you know, with the, with the, um, the parented response or retort, oh, well, race is a social construct. Well, so is working in cubicles. That's a social construct, too. Just telling me something is a social construct isn't enough, right? You have to talk about how it functions. How does that social construct function, okay? And so what we realize is that we've been very limited under this diversity, inclusion, and multiculturalism paradigm. We need new paradigms because this paradigm does make people feel good. It does bring representation. It does celebrate difference but it focuses only on difference and not disparity. And what it makes people believe is just that being nice people is just good enough. Just the golden rule, treat people how you want to be treated, right? But that maintains the status quo. Mm -hmm. And what we know about the status quo, that the status quo does what? It continues to produce racial inequities. That's right. And the, the status quo of our society is the reproduction of racial inequality. That's what it does. It's a default of all of our institutions, our norms, and our policies. It's what our society does. It's what it's always done. Our outcomes are not improving. By many measures, our outcomes of racial disparity are increasing, right? And all this system needs to keep on keeping on reproducing racial inequality with whites benefiting from it is for white people just to be really nice. <laughs> Smile at your coworkers of color, give them a presentation, and do nothing else. Niceness is not anti racist. Niceness will not get racism on the table, and it will not keep it on the table when everyone wants it off the table. It, I suppose it's better than not being nice, but it takes strategic intentional anti-racist action. And so what do we mean by anti-racist action? I always pair anti-racism with anti-sexism because one, I can give good juxtapositions and comparative analysis, but two, they go hand in hand. So let me give you an example of our assumption that the reason why we have racial animus is because we don't know each other's stories. So we spend a whole lot of time having people share their stories from different cultural backgrounds or their individual stories. It's because we got to get to know each other and we haven't been in proximity and we haven't been around people that's different than us. Then how do you explain sexism? The sexism exists because men haven't been in proximity to women? That men have never heard women's stories? No, the problem isn't that we haven't heard stories. It's the fact that we are operating off of narratives that have been given to provide rationales on why to uh, exempt certain groups or to exclude certain groups. That's what we're dealing with. And it gives a rationale on exploitation. The narratives that we're operating off of provide rationales for exploitation in terms of sexism for women, in terms of racism for people who are classified as non-white. And so to be anti-racist is an active Thing. It's not just being passive saying, well, I don't see color. And an anti-racist and an anti-sexist seeks to rid an organization in terms of education, curriculum, and learning environment, right, of all forms of racism and sexism. Because we have to understand that this issue is not going to be solved just by conversations. And Jelani Cobb makes that very clear mm -hmm. in this video. Jelani Cobb is a University of Connecticut history professor and also a prolific writer for the New Yorker magazine. And as you've listened to this unfold, what have you heard left unsaid? Mm. <clears throat> First, I'd say that um, it's very difficult to continually have this conversation, that we saw this conversation after Baltimore, we saw this conversation after Ferguson, 
uh, we're having this conversation now, and no doubt there'll be some occasion for us to have this conversation again in the future. Which breaks my heart. It does. Um, and I think that, you know, with no um, ill intent, we've greatly overestimated two things. One, the power of conversation, and two, the extent of the benevolence of white people in America. Um, what do you mean? And what I mean by that is this, that uh, there are studies that show that more than half of white people feel that in this country feel that they are the primary victims of racism. And that if having a dialogue, slavery did not begin because of miscommunication. Jim Crow <laughs> did not happen. Jim Crow did not happen because people somehow couldn't get on the same page. That these were systems that were designed to exploit one group of people to the benefit of another group of people. And unless we're willing to talk about this, these connections between what Dylan Roof saw as himself as a part of an aggrieved group of people who were besieged by black people, by black. which is the same thinking that animated the violent attacks on black people in this state after reconstruction, the white belief that black people had something that they were not entitled to, that somehow or another, that they were losing out, that the, the, uh, the currency of whiteness had been devalued. And this is what we're talking about here. And so it is about interests. It is about who has resources. It is about who has excess resources. It is about who is willing to part with those resources. And so when we look at the projections for America going into 2050, in terms of the changes in the majority of particular religious groups, uh, the change in demographics in terms of age, and definitely the changes in terms of numbers uh, in uh, uh, racial and eth ethnic makeup, right? We have to come to some type of understanding of what we're really dealing with and knowing that this notion of kumbaya is not going to work, but we really have to go from reckoning to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, restoration and to go from reckoning to restoration, we have to go past equity to justice, right? And to get to justice, we have to understand what I just was talking about. We have to question our assumptions. We have to uh, interrogate the narratives. We have to adopt frameworks. I mean, reconcile the history, adopt frameworks, and then we have to get in practice. But one of the biggest problems we have in practice is this, is if you're in a workplace, whether you're in corporate or nonprofit, or you're in education, Right now, what you're seeing in this moment of racial reckoning is Black people in particular are going to their institution and saying, hey, we're being disproportionately impacted. And the first thing they do is they put all the Black people on a task force, right? <laughs> y'all fix the problem that we created, right? Y'all tell us what we should do, right? These people are agreed. They're not necessarily experts in this work. They just know that they're dissatisfied, right? And so this article talks about it says, feeling it is unsafe to go outside, working day and night without breaks, seeing blatant examples of racism. A lot of society is experiencing this right now, but it's only a small sample of the issues Black Americans have always had to deal with. Now, imagine that you're feeling all these pressures and your employer asks you to lead a task force to solve racial justice at the organization. This is what's happening to many Black employees nowadays. This is not a complaint, this is a reality. And so just because you're the aggrieved, doesn't mean that you know what the remedy is. But because of, we're working with a lot of organizations that aren't interested necessarily in becoming anti-racist, are interested in becoming racially literate, right? Their approach is typically some type of, well, y'all tell us what y'all want. And this is not satisfactory. And so the way in which I'm gonna wrap up is just give some recommendations on what, depending on what kind of organization you're in, how do you really deal with this? First thing you gotta do is look at senior leadership. A lot of our uh, organizations, the senior le leadership uh, is very, uh, is very homo homogeneous in makeup, right? It doesn't have a, 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 a diverse representation. And then you have to look at salary equity. You have to disaggregate the, the salary and job classes and look at uh, payment uh, uh, gender-wise as well as cultural groups. And then you have to do an audit, not only audit you know, for the inventory that you do as an organization or your traditional uh, accounting audit. I'm talking about your vendor relationships. How many vendor relationships do we have with various uh, 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 diverse groups? What are our policies around recruitment and hiring, right? 
Do we have a process that in and of itself produces inequities based on where we advertise our jobs, how we write our jobs posts, where we post our jobs, right? What is the interview process? What is our, what is our rubric? Are people sitting in a room saying, well, you know, it's really just about fit. I just got a really good feeling that such and such is a good fit. Well, what does fit mean, right? What about our employee relations groups, those affinity groups? for uh, people of color and for women, right? What about how are we empowering them? Do they just exist on the fringes? You know, uh, I get invited sometimes to work with affinity, uh, affinity groups or employee relations groups, and I find out that they don't even have a budget. So they're like, we, it's Black History Month, could you come give a talk? And I'm like, well, you work for one of the largest global corporations on the planet. How much do you have? Oh, we don't have a budget. You don't have a budget? I just read in the newspaper that your corporation just broke billions, con billions, ton trillion records in earnings this quarter, but you don't have any money for Black History Month? That don't even match, right? How does that even, how is that even acceptable within these large organizations? And then you also have to have quantitative and qualitative indicators on if your organization is becoming more racially literate and anti-racist, meaning that you have to say, let's look at uh, uh, quantitative things like the diversity makeup of our, of our teams. Uh, let's look at our vendor relationships. Let's look at our customer-based things of that nature. But then you also have to have these qualitative things where you looking at climate and assessing how people feel within the institution and, and checking on their voice. If you're an organizer, right, you have to look at your strategic alliances. Right? A lot of us have these alliances. We act like these alliances are supposed to be permanent. Some of our alliances should just be issue-based. We should just say, hey, we're coming together with this organization because we agree on this issue. We don't agree on everything, but this is the issue. Right? And one of the challenges we're having is that we think we have to agree on everything or we have to fully uh, immerse ourselves with other organizations. It's okay for your organization to maintain its identity and have these strategic alliances. Our work has to be centered on justice. Right, not just on belonging or feeling good or trying to have some type of moralistic appeal. Right, specific demands. A lot of times we come into uh, interface with uh, 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 institutions that have power, and we're making these demands, and they're very ambiguous. There's no way to measure if we're getting there or not. Right, so we have to have specific demands, and we have to have our work rooted in the socio historical realities. It's not about as if everything that's happening in a vacuum. When you see all these people in the streets. Right, George Floyd is not the first nor the last black person that will be killed in an extrajudicial judicial way by a police officer. And we have a whole history of that. So we have to say, how have we responded to this in the past? What are the lessons we can learn so we don't no longer make the same mistakes to, to end up in the same situation? And we have to have frameworks for operating for our family. We can't just be out here just shooting from the hip. We have to say we're doing this because it's rooted in these particular frameworks right, that are supposed to yield these types of results. And we're not saying that you stay lockstep permanent with those frameworks, but you've got to have some type of frame of reference to even deviate from. And for those who are an educational institution, if you're trying to do this work and you have not done significant climate surveys and got an understanding of how students feel and how faculty, staff, and administrators feel within the organization, you're not going to go very far. You have to have a baseline on where the uh, environment is. If you're a faculty member, you have to examine your syllabus. You have to examine your teaching and learning methods and your grading methods. What I tell a lot of educators is that you can have a course on Paulo Freire and all your books are Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Pedagogy of Hope, Pedagogy of Freedom, and you can talk about how bad the banking method is and you can go through all these things. But if you do it in the traditional way, <laughs> right, you actually have demonstrated, right, the antithesis of what you're teaching. So we have to think about what does an equity-minded syllabus emphasize? What does an equity-minded teaching and learning approach uh, uh, privilege? Do we privilege just the material or do we privilege the relationships so that the students can uh, access the material? If you have professional staff, we have to go beyond the, the warm handoff thing. Oh, well, I, I, I talked to this student, they need to go to financial aid, I introduced them to Chris, Chris is in financial aid. But, are we explaining to our students what they're supposed to get out of that experience, right? 
And administration, when we're making budget decisions and policy decisions, are we having an equity-minded prism? Are we noticing that particular communities continue, consistently be disproportionately impacted when we ought to make rough financial decisions like we're making in this COVID-19 moment? And then we have to make sure that our organizations are having consistent professional learning experiences so that this work is braided within the fabric of the institution and they're not these one-off lectures or these one-off workshops. Because we have learned from the great Amakal Cabral that for us to truly achieve justice and for us to truly be able to have a society where we have harmonious, harmonious human relationships, we can tell no lies, mask no difficulties, mistakes, or failures, and claim no easy victories. And I'm here to tell you right now today that the work is simple, but it's not easy. But I have faith that we can do it, we can persevere, and we can endure because we're in a moment right now where we never thought that we could do all the work that we're doing in a virtual environment, and we've been able to switch to a virtual environment in a matter of weeks and months. And that same persistence, that same innovation, that same ingenuity, and that same creativity that came to bringing the world to a virtual world can take place into bringing a more just and harmonious world. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, uh, Dean Hotep. Uh, I think we have time actually for about two questions. And unfortunately, we only have uh, time for two. Uh, and if I could, uh, uh, let me see, uh, if someone wants to unmute and then ask a question, I think that we can do that. Lazana, could I get you to uh, take your, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, is there anybody, you know, no questions? Um, let me make an announcement and maybe somebody will have a question. Uh, I just, oh, wow. I, I, I just look, uh, you know what? There's so many good, great people on, on this, but one of my, one of my favorite, um, basketball stars his own line mark macon i just happened to see him he was he was temple's forever greatest basketball player mark it's good to see you all right okay so but anyway i'm sorry it just that just i think mark macon I mean, wow that's great likewise but, it look, but huh it's good thank to see you, you mark good yeah. to see you as well yeah thank you very much i'm so happy so okay so um I want to make an announcement that our next presentation will be actually Dr. Na Dove, and she will be presenting on October the 11th at the same time. And uh, if you need the if you need the ID number, I can give it to you now. I will normally announce it for those in the Philadelphia area on WURD, but you will also be getting you should be getting a uh, announcement from our office regarding this next lecture, which would be on, which is really, I'm reading the title here. It would be on cultural heritage, uplifting Cushitic women. These are the women of Kush. This is the great uh, Nubian civilization. She's going to show us the relationship between the uh, ancient classical African women and our cultural heritage today. And that's on October the 11th. And the number uh, for that, the ID number is 922-6483-9739. And I'll read it one more time for you. It is 922-6483-9739. So uh, I just want to say any, any questions uh, for uh, Dean Hotel? Anyone? Okay, I just want to, if that's it, uh, Dean Hotel, I don't thank see you, it. Thank you, thank you for the invitation yeah. every year. You know, I want the first weekend in October. And thank you <laughs> who's engaging. I, I see Dr. Dove has her hand raised. Dr. Dove, go right ahead. 
Yes, I, I just wanted to say that don't take the no question as being anything to do with a, a lack of understanding or appreciation. Just wanted to say it was a wonderful, thoroughly covered um, uh, presentation and, you know, we really appreciate and uh, sometimes there's just nothing to say when you get the whole thing and everything, <laughs> is covered, you know, you, you just can't say anything, you know, but, but thank you and, you know, many blessings and I know everybody feels the same way, so. Yeah. I appreciate it, and I, and I can feel the affirming energy. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I feel you all are, are able to to resonate actually through this screen for some reason. I can well, do it, and so I feel full, and I feel whole, and I feel a part of a, a global African community when I'm in this space. So thank you very much. Well, well, it's your spirit, and I just want to thank the the four people who reached out to me on chat to finally get me to stop rustling my papers. I was, I was writing feverishly, and I was trying to write my notes, and I didn't know that my, my, my audio was on. And they reached out to me through email and through text mail. and through, So I finally got it, and I hope I didn't disturb too many people. But thank you very much. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Yes, sir. If someone wants to access the recording. How do, how does someone access the recording? The recording we will rec we will put the recording on YouTube in about three days. Okay. So we'll and you just go to MKA Lectures, MKA Institute Lectures. Thank you, Baba. All thank right. Thank you again, and I look forward to reengaging the community soon. All right. Now, thank you very much. Bye bye.